G'day and welcome to Nevadia. Hello and welcome to everyone who has subscribed over the past few weeks. If you are here for the drama, well, do I have something for you? Anti-vaxxers! Hooray! Well, not really, because H Bomber Guy did an amazing job over here on the modern anti-vax movement. But I want to go way, 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 way back to the very start of the vaccine and inoculation movement with the relatively unknown and definitely not famous at all disease that you will 100% never have heard of before. Smallpox. Before I start, this is a complimentary video to the stream I did with my friend and script editor Alikai, which you should see here. She talked about how smallpox shaped Japan's history. It is very interesting. By the way, this is going to be a very information dense video. So I've linked the script with sources in the description below so you can follow me as I talk. It's in a Google Drive document. In case you don't know the f anything about smallpox, it is one of two, yes, two diseases that have been deliberately exterminated from the planet through vaccination and eradication efforts. The other one is a disease called rinderpest, which affected mainly your ungulates, which are your cattle, your butterfly and other hoofed animals. In 2011, this disease was declared eradicated by the World Organization for Animal Health. Yes, yeah, science, bitch. The next diseases on our radar are guinea worm, polio, measles, mumps and rubella. So what is smallpox? I've never heard of it. Well, thankfully I am here to say large words. Will you be able to understand these words? Hopefully. If not, at least you get to hear me say large words in an Australian accent. And let's be honest, that's like the hottest thing on the internet. Smallpox is a disease caused by two viruses, variola major and variola minor. These are in the genus Orthopox virus, which includes mpox and cowpox. Fun fact, chickenpox isn't in this group. It is caused by the varicella zoster virus. From now on, I'm going to be talking only about variola major, unless otherwise stated, and I'm going to be calling it VARV because my god, that's much easier to say. I'm going to do a very quick crash course on viruses and how they work to become infectious because this is an important piece of information and I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. Viruses are basically little packets of genetic material that are found inside capsids, which are protein shells. There are two types of viruses, enveloped and non-enveloped. Enveloped means there's a lipid bilayer surrounding the virus's capsid. A lipid is a molecule, usually fat or an oil, that groups together because they're hydrophobic. A lipid bilayer has two layers of a lipid molecule, the tails being hydrophobic and pointing towards the middle of the layer, and the uh, <coughs> heads are on the surface of the bilayer because they are attracted to the water. Non-enveloped viruses can also be called naked because, you know, science is sexy. The lipid layer of enveloped viruses tends to be easier to destroy. This is because they are susceptible to detergents, heat and drying out amongst other environmental stresses. For example, SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus, which is why washing your hands with soap and water or using a high alcohol content hand sanitizer is strongly suggested to protect yourself from COVID. Viruses enter cells through many, many different pathways. And for even some of the most well-studied viruses, their invasion mechanism is still unclear. As a general rule, the virus attaches itself into the host and basically jizzes its genetic material into it. Wow, I will never do that again. This material hijacks the cell's reproductive machinery to manufacture new viruses. One of two things happens afterwards. Encapsulated viruses blob out of the cell, taking some of the membrane with them and eventually the cell dies. Naked viruses, on the other hand, build up inside the cell until it explodes like an overfilled water balloon, spilling viruses into the environment outside of the cell or the extracellular space, if you want to be very sexy with those large sexy words. Viruses can be single or double-stranded DNA or RNA. Yes, you can have single-stranded DNA and double-stranded RNA. Genetics is complicated. Okay, Navadia, this is all very exciting, but what has this got to do with smallpox? Well, VARV is an encapsulated double-stranded DNA virus. What does that mean? Excellent question. See, I told you that speaking large words in an Australian accent is just really sexy. Okay, I'll break that down. It is a non-naked virus that uses double-stranded DNA for its genetic material. 
Usually RNA viruses like SARS-CoV-2 uses the cell's protein making machine, the ribosome, to make more viruses. On the other hand, DNA viruses actually enter the cell's nucleus to do their reproducing. The nucleus is the part of the cell that stores the DNA. Check out this video here where I explain DNA replication. I mean, if you're not going to shamelessly plug your own stuff, who will? However, VARV and other pox viruses is weird because it doesn't enter the cell nucleus to replicate like other DNA viruses do. It replicates in the cytoplasm, which is the gel-like substance within the cell where all the organelles hang out. The VARV virus and other pox viruses actually encodes its own replication and transcription enzymes and factors. Rather than hijacking the cell's machinery to replicate, VARV enters the cell pre-equipped with everything it needs to begin self-replication all on its own. Which, if it wasn't for the fact this is honestly one of the most horrific diseases you can come across, is pretty freaking cool. Valve looks like this, depending on where it is in its life cycle. For those of you who are unable to look at the screen right now, it looks a bit like your stereotypical dog's bone surrounded by a double layered football with ridges on the outside. By the way, I was only able to find one unsighted source for the life cycle of smallpox. So instead, I'm going to relate the following life cycle using a generic pox virus, which is extremely similar in mechanism for infection and life cycle to smallpox. Because of course, smallpox is a pox virus. I strongly suggest you read the article called the pox virus host cell entry, which I've linked in the description below. It is very, 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 very detailed and very, 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 very cool. I'm just giving you the footnotes, really. Read it, it is crazy cool. This is what smallpox looks like outside of the cell. Do you see how it has two layers? Well, the weird thing about pox viruses is that they have two types of infectious particles, mature variants or MVs, where the pox is basically non-enveloped and extracellular variants or EVs, where a pox virus is enveloped. In either form, the virus moves across the host cell until it fuses with entry receptors and gets numbed up by the cell. This either happens through endocytosis, which basically means that the cell eats the virus, or it enters through the plasma membrane or the cell's skin. The really cool thing is, when intact, the MV and EV stages of the virus do not share surface epitopes, which is the part of the virus where an antibody attaches itself. That is freaking cool, except for the whole death thing. Basically, that means that even though it's the same virus, the body effectively needs to launch an immune response to two different infectious agents. That is cool. Again, except for the death section. I found this part fascinating. MVs, or the naked version of the pox virus, have a tough outer shell and are thought to facilitate transmission between hosts, or in other words, are the infectious agent passed from one person to another. Because EVs have a fragile outer membrane, they specialise in infection between cells. Meaning the EV variant maintains infection within the host rather than focusing spreading to new host, which is what the MV does. That is cool! And horrifying! Going back to the life cycle of the virus, when the virus enters the cell, the outermost layer or layers get stripped from it. Just because I have that sexy Australian accent, I will tell you that in EV mode, in addition to other surface molecules, cowpox and possibly small and mpox viruses too, bind to glycosaminoglycans or <coughs> gags. Here's a tissue if you need one. Glycosaminoglycans are incredibly diverse carbohydrates that have a large variety of functions in the cell, including letting things enter and exit the cell. In a pox virus infection, if <laughs> gags aren't used, binding may be mediated by interactions between the proteins on the surface of the MV version of the virus and the extracellular matrix glycoprotein laminin. Uh, do you need another tissue? Okay, a stupidly abbreviated explanation of what this particular glycoprotein family does is that it helps with cell differentiation, organization, proliferation, adhesion, and specialization, amongst other things. And I mean, that is stupidly abbreviated. This is disgustingly complicated. To explain what the laminin family does would require about a 45 hour video. And as much as I love explaining science to people, 
I'm not really willing to do the equivalent of a PhD video for a YouTube channel. Okay, back to the generic pox virus. After it enters the cell, the outer layers get removed and the core, the part that contains the DNA, is released into the cell. Remember, the virus DNA has all of the information it needs to create a new viral particles, so it doesn't need to use the cell's machinery to make more of itself. It comes prepackaged. No stealing needed. The DNA then gets to work making the proteins needed for the pox virus in two stages. The first stage encodes the non-structural proteins, such as the ones necessary for replication of the viral genome. This is typically done before the replication of the genome, which, you know, makes sense. The second stage expresses structural proteins, which is necessary for basically turning a whole heap of viral DNA into an actual virus. Despite its huge size and complexity, its replication is fairly quick and takes around about 12 hours. Eventually, the virus is released as an EV into the extracellular matrix and it exits the cell, stealing from the cell wall as it does so. This is why it has an extra layer. The virus travels to another cell and the infection starts again. A reminder, this information is based on a generic pox virus, so it's broadly accurate to smallpox. I found a few different sources talking about how smallpox replicates within the body and it seems like it, cowpox and mpox all share similar life cycles. So where did smallpox come from? It is thought to have evolved from a camel or horse pox virus. However, some people think it may have evolved from a rodent pox virus. By the way, pox viruses appear in pretty much every animal species on the planet, even fish and dolphins and insects. There are a lot of other viruses closely related to VARV, which means that if you are looking at its phylogenetic tree, you need to make sure you clarify the evolutionary specialization of VARV into humans. Specialization in a species means that a disease has no reservoir in other animals, meaning it won't infect animals outside of that species. For example, measles has no animal reservoir as it only infects humans. Phylogenetic reconstruction found that smallpox, camelpox, and teteropox viruses evolved more or less simultaneously from a common ancestor that existed around 3,100 years ago. Then, not entirely sure where or when it evolved. In 2009, Shelkanov hypothesized that it evolved in either India or the Middle East due to genetic variability of the different Indian valve strains, but there were large-scale epidemics of smallpox in India at recent times, which could explain the variability. Also, there's larger genetic differences between the West African subtype and other VARV strains, suggesting it could have actually evolved in West Africa. In 2012, Babkin and Babkina suggest that VARV evolved from a camelpox-like virus that was able to infect rodents and other mammals. The naked soul gerbil is the only host of the teteropox virus, and its range is isolated in Africa between the rainforests in the south and the Sahara Desert in the north. Domestic cannibals were imported into Africa around 3,500 and 4,500 years ago. They assumed when camels arrived in Africa, the camelpox-like ancestor virus was forced into speciations to infect three different animal species. This was thought to be due to the unique antibodies camels had. These new pox viruses were camelpox, teteropox, and of course, our old frenemy, smallpox. Other sources I have found say that smallpox evolved around 10,000 years ago. So long story short, it evolved from around 10,000 to 2,500 years ago, but most scientists have settled on it evolving around 3,000 years ago. It is currently unknown when smallpox arrived in the human population. A 2015 article in the journal Viruses, written on the phylogeny of VARV, suggests it evolved into smallpox around 600 BCE, which is about 2,500 years ago. Despite this, there were no definitive writings about smallpox or a smallpox-like virus until the 1st to 4th century CE in India. Some sources have suggested it could have arrived in India as early as the 15th century BCE, but they are inconclusive. The first reliable description of smallpox in China dates back to the 4th century CE, with evidence suggesting it arrived there in about the 3rd century BCE. There's some suggestions of smallpox lesions on the face of the mummy of Ramses V, who died in 1157 BCE, but there's no reliable source that suggests that any smallpox epidemic was in Egypt at the time. These lesions could have been caused by other diseases or pox viruses. That's not to say it wasn't smallpox, but they're also not saying that it was smallpox. So when did smallpox arrive in the human population? To be honest, we have no bloody idea. Roughly around 3,000 years ago. Okay, 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 Navadia, yes, this is all very interesting science-y, but what about the disease? I want to know the gory stuff. 
My friends, there is a reason why I've written four pages worth of information before I started describing smallpox. I have a fairly strong stomach when it comes to diseases. I mean, when I was learning about cholera, I was mildly uncomfortable. I was listening to a podcast called This Podcast Will Kill You and I had to turn it off because the symptoms they were describing were absolutely horrendous. When I tell you this is a trigger warning, I mean it. I am not exaggerating. I've put a chapter in the video you can skip to if you are squeamish about these sorts of things. And trust me, it's horrific. Smallpox is spread by aerosols and close contact with the infected person. The incubation period is pretty long from 10 to 14 days, but usually around 12. Luckily, it's not likely to be spread by asymptomatic carriers. The first sign of illnesses are fever, headaches, muscle aches, fatigue, and generally feeling crappy. And when I say crappy, I mean crappy, as in pinned to the bed feels like you're dying levels of crappy. This lasts around two to four days. This is where smallpox gets to be really horrendous. A red rash starts to appear, generally on the face, and in the mouth, then the sores appear within the mouth. When they break open, they spill viral particles everywhere. The rash will then spread to the rest of the body. And I mean the rest of the body. This stage lasts about four days and is the most infectious period. Lesions will appear in the body and the sores will fill with fluid to become quite firm to the touch with a characteristic dimple in the center of the lesion. These lesions appear everywhere and often touch one another. This is important for later. Not even the palms of your hands or the soles of your feet are spared. These pustules are literally covering your entire body. The pustular scab and rash stage ramps up where the pustules are described as peas or ball bearings under the skin. Again, these sores are literally all over the body. Not just on the skin, but in the mouth too. And everywhere, there is a mucous membrane. Think about that just for a minute. Wherever, there's a mucous membrane. This part lasts about 10 days. After about five more days, the lesions start to crust over and scabs start to fall off. Remember, these smallpox lesions are almost always touching each other, meaning that during this phase, the skin is literally falling off. Not just a little bit at a time. I mean the skin. Your skin falls off. Granted, there's a layer of skin underneath the scabs, but bleh. You are infectious with smallpox until the last scab comes off. And not only are you infectious, your scabs are too. This whole process can last over two weeks. This is a long, long time to be sick if you were lucky enough to survive. 20 to 40% of people who got it didn't. Generally, it is said that 30% of people who got it died, but that changes from place to place and demographic to demographic. To put that into perspective, the last case of smallpox in the world was in 1977, and in the 20th century alone, it killed an estimated 300 million people in 77 years. And there was an eradication effort during the 20th century. And that's just run-of-the-mill ordinary smallpox, because if oozing out of pustules all over your body for weeks on end doesn't sound fun, wait until I tell you about malignant smallpox. You know that crappy feeling that starts off with fevers, aches, etc.? That's called the prodrome stage. Malignant smallpox has a longer prodrome period. When the pustules appear in the person, they stay flat, soft, and velvety. It was almost always fatal, and sadly, over 70% of the people who got it were children. But wait, there's more. Because if that didn't horrify you enough, there's another version. Hemorrhagic smallpox. And yes, it is exactly what it sounds like. You would bleed. And not just into the pustules, into your skin. The whites of your eyes would turn black. Your blood clots in your capillaries as it comes out. So it is thick and dark and all throughout your body. People turned purple. You bleed out of your mucous membranes, which are pretty much part of every orifice of your body. When autopsied, it was noted that victims also have bleeding into their organs. It is almost always fatal, for fairly obvious reasons. 
Luckily, hemorrhagic smallpox accounted for 2% of cases, but a whopping 3 to 25% of deaths. It is unknown why people get a hemorrhagic smallpox, but a study in 1965 by McKenzie et al. suggested that early hemorrhagic patients showed a deficiency of platelets, prothrombin, and accelerated globulin, and increased circulating antithrombin. Patients with a late form of hemorrhagic smallpox showed significant thrombocytopenia and less severe deficiency of the same coagulation factors. A few also had increased antithrombin. If you were pregnant and got infected, you were also at an increased risk of hemorrhagic smallpox. The fourth version of smallpox was known as modified smallpox, and it was just a breakthrough for people who had been vaccinated. It was significantly less severe than the full-blown disease, and no fatalities were recorded. Do you know what the worst thing is? You know how when you're sick, you kind of zonk out for a week? Yeah, for some unknown reason, smallpox doesn't do that to you. So people are aware during the entire time they were sick. If you survived, you were at risk of encephalitis, blindness, and disfigurement. Obviously, you lose most of your skin. If you contracted it as a child, osteomyelitis could occur, causing arthritis and bone deformities. And those were just a handful of the complications. It would take me forever to list them here. Oh, and uh, remember when I said it can cause blindness? That's because pustules can occur on the eyelid conjunctiva and cornea. They were in your bloody eyes. There were pustules on your eyes. So yeah, that smallpox. Aren't you glad I put this later in the video? For everyone who didn't see this part, you're welcome. What's really cool is that hundreds of years ago, people figured out that if they took pus from a smallpox lesion and stabbed it into their own skin or snorted the powdered scabs, the disease would be less intense than full-blown smallpox. This was called variolation and is obviously the precursor to immunization. The terms variolation and inoculation are interchangeable, but only when you're talking about smallpox, as variolation refers to the variola virus. So you can be inoculated against measles, but you can't be variolated against it because measles isn't smallpox. And to make things even more confusing, inoculation and vaccination are more or less interchangeable, unless you're a microbiologist, which is a tangent that I don't need to get into. The reason why variolation produced a less severe infection is because people were infecting themselves using a different route the virus used. To get full-blown smallpox, you need to inhale the virus from airborne particles that the infected person coughed out, just like SARS-CoV-2. However, if the virus enters your body through a different route, such as sniffing ground up scabs or through the blood, the virus cannot replicate in its preferred area and the body has a better chance of fighting it off. This doesn't mean that it was completely safe. About 2% of people who were inoculated with smallpox died, but better than 30%, hey. Because colonialism is a thing, obviously the first person notable for inoculation of smallpox was the English woman Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, who popularised the process in England and Europe. We'll ignore the thousands of years of history of variolation and praise her, as well as Cotton Mather, who also encouraged people to undergo variolation. Cotton Mather was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and was a Puritan clergyman. We'll ignore that he learnt about inoculation from his slave Onesimus, who he got as a gift from his congregation. Oh, and as an aside, he also wrote the book Memorable Providences, which laid the groundwork for the Salem witch trials and was instrumental in the conviction and execution of the Catholic washerwoman Goody Glover. We don't know much about Onesimus, mainly because he was a slave. We don't even know what his birth name was because Mather named him after a slave in the Bible whose name meant useful in Greek. Overall, Mather was clearly a pleasant gentleman. But why did Onesimus tell Mather about variolation? Because a slave that had recovered from smallpox was worth more than the one that had never had it. Capitalism! Yes! When Mather asked him whether he had smallpox or not, Onesimus replied, yes and no. He explained the procedure, showing the scar on his arm. Mather used this information to spread variolation amongst American people and was broadly successful with some hip cups, one coming in the form of a grenade through a window. On the upside, Onesimus was able to purchase his freedom in 1716, so it wasn't all bad. No, actually, it was fucking terrible. Despite the incredible evidence from thousands of years of this procedure supporting variolation as an alternative to 
actual smallpox, debate raged on how safe it actually was. And to be fair, it was still pretty dangerous. As I said, up to 2% of people died from variolation and some people got very sick from it. But comparing it to the actual disease, it's definitely the better option. Hmm, feels like I've said this before. And of course, in Boston, people did not want to take a medical procedure that was developed by black people. Racism! Gotta love it! I think we need to appreciate that. Despite his situation, Onesimus saved the lives of many people by explaining inoculation against smallpox to a guy who owned slaved and contributed to multiple deaths by accusing innocent people of witchcraft and promoted the violent spread of Puritan Christianity in America. Let's fast forward to 1768 to some English bloke called Dr. John Fuster. He discovered that some people in the town he worked at did not respond to variolation by producing the typical pustules and illness associated with it. These people told Fuster that they had recovered from cowpox earlier that year. Fuster took note, but didn't quite understand the significance of this chain of events. Cowpox is in the same family as smallpox, yet it produces a much less severe disease in humans. Dr. Fuster went to a medical community meeting at an inn called The Ship and told his colleagues about the cow and smallpox connection. A young whippersnapper called Edward Jenner was there. Over the next few decades, Jenner was obsessed with the idea that cowpox could convey immunity to smallpox, earning himself the nickname, the cowpox boar. Oi, that cowpox boar guy's initial work led to the eradication of one of the deadliest diseases on the planet. So you give that man some respect. You people in the 1700s, you respect that man. God, I'm an idiot. In 1796, Sarah Nelms was infected with cowpox from her cow called Blossom. Her hide, Blossom's, not Sarah's, hangs in St. George's University, London. Dr. Jenner took some pus from Sarah's hand and inoculated it into an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps. He became sick, but recovered in two weeks. As this was a time before medical ethics, six months after recovering from cowpox, Dr. Jenner deliberately infected James with smallpox. Cool and normal. Thankfully, two things happened. The first one was that Fuster's observations were accurate, and the second one was that Sarah was infected with cowpox and not some other disease. These two occurrences led to young Jimmy not getting smallpox. This was a huge discovery, and Jenna started advocating vaccinating people against smallpox by using cowpox. Despite the fact that people had been getting cowpox for literally centuries, some people thought that getting the vaccine would turn them into cows, like it had some sort of gene editing capabilities. Hmm, why haven't I heard that before in regards to vaccines recently? I don't know, don't know. However, by 1801, extensive testing showed that it was safe and effectively protected against smallpox. In honour of the virus that conferred immunity to smallpox, Dr. Jenner named the process vaccination and the drugs vaccines, as vaca is the Latin word for cow. Dr. Edward Jenner's story is quite interesting and very sad. While I joked earlier that he was a bit dodgy medical ethics wise, it was actually fairly standard procedure at the time to experiment on random people, mainly prisoners and orphans. James Phipps was the son of a poor man. Despite the potential financial boon this discovery would deliver, he never tried to monetize it and often would be embarrassed by the fact he didn't have enough cowpox samples to send to medical acquaintances. His personal and professional life suffered and was the target of both international recognition and severe hate. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Anyway, he received £10,000 from the government in 1802 and another 20000 a year later, equating to at least £2.5 million in today's money. He eventually retired and vaccinated the poor for free. So he was actually a pretty good bloke. He sired three or maybe four children. I have conflicting reports. Two of his children died of tuberculosis in 1810 and in 1812 a third child died and then his wife in 1815. That poor man. He eventually died of a massive stroke in January in 1823. 200 years ago this year. Rest in power mate. Rest in power. Because Australian history is almost exclusively ignored by, well, the world, including Australians, I'll give a little bit of history of smallpox in the non-existent country. There was a smallpox outbreak in Sydney in 1789, and there's still some debate as to how it got there. While the European colonisers are somewhat immune, Indigenous Australians were not. Smallpox ravished the Indigenous Australians, just as it had the First Nations people of the Americas, which is a history all unto itself. 
Needless to say that any population that hadn't been exposed to this deadly virus before is going to lose a quarter to a third of its population, at least, or in the case of the Indigenous Australians, much more. In April of 1789, David Collins, the judge advocate of the colony, wrote this heart-wrenching story. At that time, a native was living with us, and on taking him down to the harbour to look for his former companions, those who witnessed his expression and agony can never forget either. He looked anxiously around him in the different coves we visited. Not a vestige on the sand was to be found of human foot. Not a living person was anywhere to be met with. It seemed as if, flying from the contagion, they had left the dead to bury the dead. He lifted up his hands and eyes in silent agony for some time. At last he exclaimed, All dead! All dead! And then hung his head in mournful silence. Seventy to ninety percent of Indigenous Australians who got smallpox were killed by the disease. It is unknown how it was spread to the tribes, and considering the devastation it wreaked amongst the people, anyone who might have known probably never would have spoken up. Unlike in America, people were not systematically ordered by their extremely high superiors to deliberately infect them with smallpox, so yay Australia? But what? Extremely high superiors? What, what do you mean by that? Well, there's some evidence to suggest that smallpox was deliberately spread to the tribes as an act of bio-warfare, but it wasn't sanctioned by England. So, not yay Australia? Either way, smallpox was introduced to the indigenous people with devastating effects. People were happy to blame the French for bringing smallpox to the First Nations tribes, as an explorer, Comte de la Perouse, had anchored his ships in Botany Bay six weeks after the British had arrived. The big problem with this theory is that if the French had brought smallpox, the outbreak would have started early in 1788, not over a year later. Other people suggested that Makassar fishermen brought the disease through the Northern Territory and it travelled down through trade routes. However, that theory has another hole in it. People can't walk while infected with smallpox and it doesn't spread asymptomatically. Darwin, where they probably traded with the Makassar fishermen, is roughly 4,000 kilometres away from Sydney and a high density of people is required to maintain an endemic infection, which, if you know anything about pre-colonial Australia, that did not exist. Not to mention that Makassar fishermen were based in Sulawesi, aka Indonesia, so they would have had to cross the ocean while infected with smallpox. Not likely. A more plausible explanation was that on the First Fleet, the surgeon John White brought some smallpox samples to variolate children that were born in the colony, and it escaped. Or that it was used without official orders as biowarfare, which is also extremely likely. Other people suggested that it came through in the Second Fleet, as there were some people who were infected with smallpox on the boat HMS Sirius. Fast forward about 200 years. Effective vaccination drives all over the world ensured that smallpox became rarer and rarer. In 1977, the last person to naturally become infected with smallpox was Ali Mao Marlin, a WHO healthcare worker who worked in vaccination drives against smallpox. Ironically, he refused the vaccination due to the fact it looked painful. I bet he regretted that decision. Luckily, he was infected with variola minor, the less lethal form of the disease, and survived. He was ordered to stay home because he could have caused an outbreak of the disease, and since he wasn't some libertarian don't tread on me dickhead, he did, and an outbreak was avoided. The hospital he worked at was shut down, and anyone who interacted him while he was pre- and post-symptomatic was vaccinated, a procedure called ring fencing. Over the following 14 days, all residents occupying the houses surrounding Ali's home were also vaccinated, which was estimated to be a whopping 50 thousand people. Three years after his infection, Somalia, and therefore the world, was declared smallpox free in 1980, 184 years after Dr. Edward Jenner, the cowpox boar, started his campaign to rid the planet of this awful disease. Ali Malmalin continued his work as a WHO vaccinator through Africa against polio and later measles after his little sister tragically died from it. In 2013, at the age of 59, he sadly passed away from complications due to malaria during a polio vaccination campaign. What an amazing man. He literally worked in war zones in the poorest and most dangerous places on the planet to ensure everyone got the health care they deserved. 
remember his name. He and people like him are absolutely the unsung heroes of international health, as outbreaks of diseases in poorer countries can reverberate throughout the entire planet. For example, cholera was introduced into Haiti through aid workers after the earthquake in 2010. Diseases don't recognise borders. Preventing outbreaks in the poorest countries in the world will stop outbreaks in the richest countries in the world. Healthcare equity benefits everyone. You might have noticed that I mentioned that Ali was the last person to be naturally infected with smallpox. The last person who was infected with smallpox came a few years later in 1978, where a nurse called Janet Parker fell ill in Birmingham, England, of all places. She was initially diagnosed with chickenpox, but Parker's mother was not so sure. After a few days of no improvement, she was transferred to Catherine de Barnes Isolation Hospital in Solihull on the 20th of August that year. The first person to see Janet Parker was Professor Deborah Simmons. She realised immediately that Parker's rash was not chickenpox, but instead smallpox. This was bizarre. How did smallpox get there when the last infection in the UK was five years earlier? It turned out that the virus had escaped through the vents at the smallpox laboratory at Birmingham Medical School, which was headed by Professor Henry Bedson. Ms Parker continued to get worse. She was left blind in both eyes and the doctors believed that she'd gone into renal failure. Eventually, she developed pneumonia and stopped responding to people verbally. Her father died of a suspected cardiac arrest, possibly caused by his daughter's illness, but no autopsy was conducted due to smallpox risks. One day later, the outbreak claimed its first, technically second victim. Not Jenna Parker, but Professor Henry Bedson. He walked into his shed and never walked out. Tragically, his note stated, I'm sorry to have misplaced the trust which so many of my friends and colleagues have placed in me and my work. It then claimed its second, technically third victim. Janet Parker died on the 11th of September, 1977. She was the last person not only to be infected with smallpox, but to have died of this horrendous disease. Clearly, it didn't go without a fight. So where are we now? Obviously, we don't need to be worried about smallpox anymore, eh? It's gone, right? Right, Nefania? Right. Please say yes. Uh, kinda? There are some samples being held in two labs, one in Russia and one in the US. And every year, there is a conference to figure out what we should do with these samples. There are pros and cons to keeping them. For example, having these samples allows for more research just in case someone decides to reverse engineer the virus and do a bioterrorism. Scientists still don't know everything they need to know about this disease. On the other hand, it's fucking smallpox. For some reason, its complete DNA sequence has been released to the public. I don't know why. I think that was a stupid idea. Another stupid idea was publishing a paper in PLOS1 which explained how they reconstructed the extinct hawkspox virus from synthetic DNA. It was infectious, by the way. Why? Why do that? Why do that? In the paper, they explained that since the traditional smallpox vaccine was quite toxic, they thought using horsepox could reduce the toxicity, yet still confer immunity to valve. But they still built an infectious pox virus from the ground up. There was literally no reason to do this. This paper, while supposedly for the good of humanity, could have given bad actors the information they need to create infectious smallpox. It just adds another layer of vulnerability into bioterrorism. Good work, guys. Wonderful idea. But here's something that's absolutely horrifying. Even though it's eradicated worldwide, it doesn't mean that the only samples are found in the labs. Other samples could be found in bodies of people who died of it and are buried in permafrost. The thing with permafrost is it's permanent and frosty. DNA, unlike RNA, is actually pretty stable. It can hang around in the environment for tens of thousands of years under ideal conditions, such as being frozen in permafrost. Unfortunately, there's this thing you might have heard of called climate change. Just in case you didn't know what climate change is, it's this phenomenon of trapping infrared radiation in the atmosphere by certain atmospheric gases, which causes the planet to get warmer. And when water gets warmer, it melts. Suddenly the permafrost is not so permanent nor frosty, meaning that certain people who died of a certain disease might start to leak said certain disease into the environment, meaning that smallpox may not need a mad scientist to release it back into the wild. 
It might just need some huge faceless corporation to release insane amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, destroying the permafrost to make a line go up. Capitalism! A Nature article called Emergent Biogeochemical Risks from Arctic Permafrost Degradation, say that 15 times, changing Arctic ecology combined with permafrost thaw raises the prospect of disease emergence. Stable conditions in permafrost have preserved fragmented genomic material from smallpox and influenza viruses, predating the first known human smallpox case by over 1,000 years. While these viruses may not be preserved in infectious forms, Recovery and reconstruction of viral genomes is ongoing. The release of intact viral pathogens from permafrost are limited by host community density and longevity, preventing long-term persistence for many virus species. Thankfully, it also says that the direct infections of humans from permafrost is improbable. However, in 2015, a woman in Fairbanks, Alaska, presented with the pox virus that had never been described by science before. Since then, another three people have been infected with this virus. It has not explicitly been linked with climate change, but human activity is thought to have contributed to the emergence of this disease. It was named Alaska pox in July 2015, after the place where it was first described. Which is a bummer, because the WHO introduced best practices for disease nomenclature in May 2015. See my video here on why naming a disease after a geological area is a bad idea. Is it likely that smallpox will come back due to climate change? No. Is it possible? Yes, but in the same way it's possible you'll be hit by lightning on a sunny day. Despite smallpox's vanishingly low chance of recurrence, what would happen if it did come back? Through lab leak, climate change or bioterrorism? Well, when it comes to lab leaks, the chances of them happening is extraordinarily unlikely. As in, so small it's probably negative. The two labs containing smallpox are so extremely tightly regulated, you're probably more likely to win the Australian Tennis Open with both arms tied behind your back than it is for it to escape from these labs. And with climate change, well, you never know. So far, thankfully, only non-viable smallpox DNA has been released into the environment. Bioterrorism is the most likely, as the genetic sequence might be able to be deducted due to the aforementioned viral DNA fragments. The WHO has banned the synthesizing or storage of more than 20% of VARV DNA sequences in individual labs, except for the two labs, one in Russia and one in the US. However, if a group of very smart and well-funded biologists without any sense of morality needed sections of VARV DNA, they could procure sequences through shady deals and, of course, water that comes from melted permafrost. Suddenly, they have been able to reverse engineer smallpox. If it ever comes back, climate change will probably be the reason, be it directly or indirectly. So what would happen if smallpox comes back? Well, it depends on so many variables. Was it released naturally through permafrost melt or a bioterrorism attack? Where was it released? When was it released? Was it released in a low or high population density area? Was it very or major or minor? Was it engineered to be more virulent? How would anti-vaxxers and disease deniers react? So, frankly, that's an impossible question to answer. However, the US has a stockpile of smallpox vaccines in the case of a bioterrorism attack. I won't comment on who is likely to be the bioterrorists, but let's just say there was a reason why the US routinely vaccinated its military against smallpox, and that it is one of two countries that has the full virus. Let's take a recent pox virus outbreak as our case study. Mpox, which was previously called monkeypox. In this video, I'll call it Mpox for a few main reasons. One, it is the preferred term used by the WHO. Two, the primary reservoirs are probably rodents and not monkeys. And three, I sound like a wannabe rap artist from the 1990s. Yeah, it's totally rad. Fuck over me. I won't go into the fact that Mpox outbreaks are quite common in Africa, but of course the rest of the world doesn't really care about it because it's Africa, right? Yay racism! In 2022, which was approximately two years after another disease outbreak you might have heard about, Mpox spread from Africa to the UK, Singapore, Israel and the US. It seemed to be spread primarily through sexual transmission, especially from men who have sex with men. However, the higher rate of Mpox being reported by this group of men is more likely due to the intergenerational trauma left by HIV and reporting of sexually transmitted diseases is highly encouraged and normalised in the GRSM community. Also, the GRSM community is often quite insular due to, well, 
bigotry. So any diseases that get introduced into this community is more likely to be spread amongst its members. That's no different to a disease being brought into a cruise ship and suddenly the amazing holiday that you booked turned into a plague ship nightmare. Mpox is spread by sex, but so is the common cold. You wouldn't call that a sexually transmitted disease, would you? Mpox isn't spread through secretions during sexual intercourse, which is the definition of an STI. It is spread by close contact with an infected person, so you can get Mpox simply by cuddling someone. Other ways it is spread were by direct contact with the Mpox rash and interpersonal contact such as sharing food, hugging and prolonged face-to-face -face contact. A report published by the WHO on the 2nd of February 2023 said in the space of a year, 88,000 600 cases had been reported and that 89 people had died worldwide. Two of the major contributing factors to the spread of Mpox was the availability of international travel and a reduction in herd immunity against pox viruses. When the world eradicated smallpox in 1980, there was no need to continue to vaccinate against it. If you want to feel old, 1980 was 43 years ago. The world's population of immune people has been steadily declining. You might remember that cowpox confers immunity to smallpox. Well, include other pox viruses to that list. As the percentage of people who were immune to smallpox declined, the more likely it was that there were going to be other pox virus outbreaks. I couldn't find out how many people would be immune to smallpox today, but it wouldn't be many. The CDC suggests that the smallpox vaccine confers immunity for three to five years, whereas the American Journal of Medicine suggests that immunity is lifelong. So in regards to immunity status of people who'd been vaccinated, eh? Regardless, people born after 1980 would not have received a smallpox vaccine with the exception of military personnel. People traveling to and from endemic Mpox regions would likely not have any immunity. Mpox was thought to have an R naught of roughly 2.44 in Europe, meaning that on average, Every person who had Mpox in 2022 in Europe was likely to spread it to 2.44 people. The guesstimated R0 of smallpox was approximately 3.5 to 6, meaning that it could be around up to three times more infectious than Mpox, which kind of makes sense as smallpox was specialised into humans. But that's just not the scary part. Diseases don't spread linearly, they spread logarithmically. So it won't be three times more people being infected, it would be log three. I have zero idea how to calculate how many people would have been infected if you were to extrapolate from Mpox data, so I won't. But it would be a lot. Not to mention the variables that could change the outcome. Do you know what else is horrifying? In case you don't remember from earlier, I mentioned that Indigenous Australians were totally immunologically naive to smallpox, and when it entered their population, 70% of the people infected died, maybe up to 90%. There hasn't been a case of smallpox in over 43 years, meaning that there are over 43 years of immunologically naive people being born. There's no treatment nor cure for smallpox. There are two potential drug treatments, tecovirumat and brincidiofovia, but they've never been tested against valve in humans, for fairly obvious reasons. With the exception of people who have been infected with a pox virus that have conferred immunity, it is quite possible an outbreak of smallpox could lead to an extremely high death rate amongst unvaccinated people. Would it be 70%? I have no idea. It's impossible to tell without releasing it back into the population, which is a bad idea in my opinion. Not to mention that, like all diseases, death is only one part of the process. Smallpox causes organ failure, blindness, infertility, and disfigurement. Even surviving smallpox can cause lifelong complications. Don't forget, there's a massive and very successful anti-vaccine social media campaign, to the point that people are trying to argue that viruses don't even exist, or if they do, they don't cause disease. If there was an outbreak of smallpox today, it would be absolutely devastating. Diseases are scary. They can and will kill you. And thanks to human activity, deadly pandemics will become more and more frequent as animals that shouldn't interact with each other are forced to due to declining habitats and urban encroachment. The time of 100 year pandemics is over. We're probably looking at a new pandemic every couple of decades now, thanks to the damage that we are wreaking upon our beautiful planet. For those of you who stayed around to the end, I will give you this tidbit of information, which I thought was cool. The cat is over there trying to find something. I thought you'd probably find that really cool. 
The reason why they called it smallpox was to differentiate between it and the great pox, aka syphilis. Syphilis and smallpox had very similar rashes, which is why they associated the two. Anyway, thank you for hanging around for another epic video. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, it was a supplementary video to a stream that I did with another content creator, Aliakai. In the meantime, scandium, iodine, nitrogen, and cerium. I just want to say a very special thank you to my wonderful patrons, especially my $10 Redback Spider patrons, Lauren Hart, Ross Devereux, and Ken Panda. I also want to say a very special thank you to my $35 Era Candy patron, Ikeda Hakubi. I hope you guys really enjoyed this deep dive into one of the most horrific diseases that you could ever possibly come across. I found it fascinating, and I hope you did too. Friend and script editor Aliyah Kai, which you should see here. Is there a cat in here? I think there is a cat in here. By the way, this is going to be a very, very information. Oh, you are in here, you little woman. Hey, look, everyone. I have a cat. I know. It's very interesting. You don't get to come in here often. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I look weird. <laughs>